In today's podcast, I meet face-to-face -face with Palau's president, Mr. Sarango Whips. If you're like most people, you've probably never heard of this small island nation, but let me tell you, there is nothing small about the culture there. With a vibrant indigenous soul and a politics of the future, Palau is soon to be one of the world's top tourist destinations, and it's already starting a recovery after COVID-19. I asked Mr. Whips what it's like to be the president and what are the biggest challenges facing Palauans today. Climate change is at the center of this podcast because it's at the center of Palau. At certain high tides now in Palau, you will see docks that are covered, streets that are, have water in them that weren't that way 50 years ago. You'll find out that the president's big message is to help Palau and to help the world as he strives to preserve Palauan culture and language on top of the beautiful coral reefs. So let's dive into it and find out why this freely associated state of America is the new land of opportunity. Your Excellency. Ali. How you doing? Uh, welcome. Pleasure to meet you. I flew from around the world to, for this moment right now. I just want to say this is a very special moment for me because I've been to 195 countries now and I've never met a president, a past or current president. So it's very much an honor for me. Oh, fantastic. You know, it's uh, a privilege for Palau to have you visit us. Hopefully this will be an opportunity to share Palau with the world. So I have a question for you. Sure. What does it feel like to be a president of a nation? I mean, they're, they're, when you make decisions, sometimes there's a, you know, a lot on your shoulders because, you know, it's people's lives that you're dealing with. Right. Especially in challenging times, that's always the biggest challenge that you have. Sure. Is, are we, am I making the right decision? Yeah. Am I putting people's lives at risk? But uh, other than that, I, I find it enjoyable because, you know, I feel like I'm making a difference. Right. And, and using my talents, you know, to the best of my ability to help others. At the end of the day, it's about serving people and and doing all we can to make their lives better. And one of the things that I, I would always say is that our goal uh, to make Palau and the people of Palau, Palauans, feel that Palau is their land of opportunity, right. where they can achieve the Palauan dream and not have to think that I have to go to America to achieve. Yes. And so that's, that's my goal. My goal is, you know, we have a beautiful environment, we have culture, be proud of your country, come back, and, right. and you know, let's make a difference. Most people have not heard of Palau. That's right, that's right. Uh, in the world, I've been telling my friends and family, and oh, I'm going to Palau, and they're like, what is that? What do you want to say about your country to those people? Well, Palau is very unique. We only have uh, 18, 20,000 people. It's a small place with a few people, but we're loving people, and we welcome you to come and, and visit us, learn about our culture, right. see our beautiful environment, build friendships. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, some of the challenges that we face, for example, climate change. Right. And it's, it's a big global issue. And uh, Palau has the opportunity next year to host our Oceans Conference. And it's, a, it's an important conference because it's going to bring world leaders to Palau and really focus on the ocean because we're a, a small island country, but impacted by climate change, by marine pollution. Right. And it's how to strike that balance of combating climate change, but at the same time having a sustainable, a fishery, having a sustainable blue economy. Right. I think Palau has the opportunity as a small place to be a leader right. as, a, as an ocean, a large ocean state. Yeah, to me it's fascinating. So, like, I feel like Palau is just putting their foot forward in sustainability. I mean, when I entered the country, I had to sign a declaration on my passport. The That's, Palau Pledge, yes. I, I mean, I've been to every country but two and I've never yeah. had to do that. It's important for us to take care of our environment because uh, it is not only uh, what sustains us, I mean, it provides our food, but right. also in this modern world, it's what brings tourists here too. Right. So we, ha we have to take care of it and we, w we ask our visitors to come mm -hmm. and share the same values. Right. Keep it clean, don't trample on the coral, right, right. don't use sunscreen that destroys the reef. The sunscreen thing. Yeah, and uh, you know, tread lightly. Are you struggling yeah. with preserving the, the identity and the culture of Palau? You know, for example, the language, you know, someone told me there's less than 10,000 people now that can really speak Palauan. Is that, a, is that one of your priorities to, to revive it? Yeah. So. Uh, we've been doing a lot of restructuring inside the government, mm -hmm. uh, trying to realign agencies, but one of the things that we really believe, if we're not careful, within the next generation, it'll be gone. Right. And it's really, you know, making sure that our kids use it in everything that they do. Like, you know, I was sharing the, the symbols. Right. If you don't say surgeon fist, say masagu, because right. that's the Palauan name for Absolutely. it. Absolutely. And, and making sure that our kids know that, because mm -hmm. if we don't have our language, then what's a Palawan? Yeah, the identity. Just, the identity is gone. And that's what's so, so unique about yeah. you know the Pacific Islands. When I go to Panape or Yap, it's just so cool that you guys have your own mm. indigenous culture. And that's well, one of the coolest things about coming here. But the challenge is with television, with the internet, with YouTube, yeah. <laughs> it's all in English, right? So the challenge is how do we immerse the kids and keep them engaged in Palawan? So 
It's developing the right curriculum. I think helping our, our kids understand the, the value of it. And you have to start with the children. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I, well, I grew up in a generation where it was, uh, if you were uh, spearfishing at night, mm -hmm. and then you, you open up your flashlight and the batteries are dead, you just toss the batteries overboard. Oh, really? Yeah. So oh, things have changed. That's for, but now that doesn't happen. Turtles, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the big Napoleon wrasse, the bumphead parrotfish, you know, you take until you, you know, freezers are full, you can do it and didn't know what to do with it. But, you know, we've wow. enacted laws to protect them. So when you're diving, you'll see lots of them. Turtles, uh, we actually have a ban right now on them, the harvesting of turtles, just because, you know, we have to do our part. Um, you mean for eating, for consuming? Yeah, yeah, for eating. So we have seasons. We try to control the consumption, and, and it's about sustainability. And we know that's what we've been eating for thousands of years, but we want to make sure that we don't overfish them because back thousands of years ago, we didn't have freezers and we didn't have thousands of visitors visiting us. So the stress on the environment, it's totally different now. Absolutely. So we've got, we've got to do our part uh, to make sure that uh, our kids won't be uh, experiencing turtles or Napoleon uh, wrasse or parrotfish uh, sure. in textbooks and, and, and looking at fossils or, right. or pictures, but actually swimming with them. That's what we want to be able to do. What does tourism mean to Palau? Well, um, I mean, it's 50% of our economy. You know, one of the things that we've had challenges, we've had times when we have 150,000 tourists and we've had zero. So it's, a, it's, it's not stable and we, it's important for us to diversify our economy. But at the same time, when it comes to the tourism sector, we want to make sure that we have tourists that really value our environment, that right. care about, you know, really investing in our people, learning about our culture. And I think that's we, the term we like to use is we want high-end tourism or tourists that are good global, global citizens that really care right. about the uniqueness that Palau has to offer. And, and I think that's the product that we want to share with the world. And we want to do our best to maintain it and preserve it. And we feel it's not just our responsibility for Palauans, but for the world. You know, we already have one World Heritage Site, which is the Rock Islands. There's a couple others that they're saying should be named because we have some terraces here that go back thousands of years. Those little stone things? No, these are actually terraces on the hillsides. Oh, terraces. Yeah, right. uh, there's a lot of history behind them. Uh, and if you talk to the archaeologists, there's just, you know, a treasure chest to be explored. In Peleliu, uh, my grandfather was in World War II. Yes. And he went and fought in the bloodiest battle there. That's right. And he got shot in the knee in Pelilu. Oh, wow. Yeah, he tells the whole story about what happened, so we're going to go there and trace his footsteps. Okay. So did, do you know what beach he came up on? I, I, we're trying to figure that out. He passed away a few months ago, oh. but we're trying to um, track down which division in the Marines he was in, but he tells very vivid stories about Pelilu. Yes. He, he was living in Manila. He was stationed in Manila, but they, they took a boat down to uh, Pelilu, and he was here there for a short time. Uh -huh. And he said it was not a pleasant scene when he was yes, there. Yes, it was, it was one of the hardest battles, uh, I think, in the Pacific. And we're grateful for what the Marines and, the, of course, the U.S. military did. But it was unfortunate. Uh, yeah. that, those are the unfortunate parts of war. Sure. And we should do everything to maintain peace because there's no winners in war, I, right. I believe. And we got to do our, our part to make sure that we maintain peace in the world. But uh, it was... It was um, Difficult battle, a lot of lives were lost. Yes. And it was a well fortified island. Uh, as you can see, Palau, our location is very strategic. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of operations that were that the Japanese Palau as a base for. Your Excellency, uh, my next question for you is what would you say are your three biggest missions or goals during your term in office? We ran, and, uh, and our goal was uh, to put people first. So it's, it's about uh, improving our healthcare system, which we uh, are already in full swing doing improving our social services to really take care of our people. Palau has done a fantastic job in terms of environment, but we wanted to really focus on our people. The other thing that we're very focused on is education. And when we talk about education, it's building the infrastructure, empowering the teachers, giving them the tools to do the best for our, our students. So it's investing in people. The other thing is really just building a strong economy that uh, is sustainable and that uh, provides a livelihood so that the Palauan people, young people especially, see Palau as a land of opportunity and where they can achieve their dreams. You know, we're doing all kinds of things. One of the major pieces of legislation that's in front of the uh, Congress right now is uh, tax reform. That's mm -hmm. always a challenge in every sure. country, but I think it's the foundation. It's important to have good tax policies. The other thing that we hope to get passed also when it comes to the economy is, you know, we believe people need to earn decent wages to take care of their families. Sure. So raising the minimum wage, which Palau's raising. What is the minimum wage, can I ask? It's currently $3.50 an hour. Which is very low. Very low. And so kids can get on the plane, go to Hawaii, and earn 15 bucks an hour. So you can see why there's that uh, challenge. So 
we need to get them in a wage up and really just provide those opportunities for our kids. And there's exciting things happening. We're getting a new fiber optic cable, so we'll have two. Maybe hopefully in the digital world, we'll provide right. opportunities for that. We're also looking at establishing um, possibilities in the financial sector. Nice. And there's you know exciting uh, possibilities in tourism. There's you a have so much for tourism. Yeah, here. there's <laughs> a Four Seasons that wants to build a resort here. Wonderful. Where that hopefully can be happen within the next few years. There's also uh, Indigo, which is an intercontinental group. Yep. They also want to do a, uh, another five-star hotel. That's here, great. So. so just you know, good investment, helping diversify the economy and helping people. You, so wonderful. Can you talk a little bit about the U.S. ties with Palau? Because I'm curious as an American. I see the school system is based off the U.S. I yeah. see, you know, people speaking English using the U.S. dollar. Um, how did that even start? And, and just talk a little bit about that, please. So, of course, after World War II, September, I think 1944, when they landed in Angar and Peleliu, won the war. Palau became a trust territory of the United States, and that lasted up until 1994. During that period, there was negotiations of what would be the future status of Palau. So there was ideas of total independence, no, mm -hmm. no affiliation with anybody, Commonwealth, and the idea of a, what we call a, a freely associated state, which is what Palau is. Right. Uh, so that really meant that we're an independent country. But when it comes to uh, defense and protection, our security, we give those rights to the United States. I think that's what makes Palau unique. We feel protected, we're right. safe, because the, we have the protection in the United States. There's no way we could have our own military. Yeah. We have a, one patrol boat. Uh, actually, we have two now. So there's no military at Palau? No military, so we have our police, and that's, uh, wow. the U.S. has uh, helped us build our education system, our health system. Mm -hmm. We use U.S. textbooks. Most of us get educated in the United States. I mean, there's other opportunities. There's a lot of kids now that go to uh, Taiwan, right. furthering their education in some other countries, but those are the two main sure. the countries that our children go to. And uh, that influence will continue to grow. Sure. That's probably why we're losing our language, which we need to also develop materials that we can teach our language mm -hmm. and, and keep it. And do people here like the United States or are there other anti people like, no, we want to be totally independent, we want to do things on our own, or is it kind of split? I think the relationship has really um, grown. I, when I was young and, and, and we were growing up, I remember seeing signs, uh, Yankee go home. A very contentious issue was in our constitution, we said we had a nuclear free provision. You know, there, that was a contentious issue because uh, U.S. military vessels, mm -hmm. they operate nuclear power plants, right? right. So eventually we agreed. Uh, to have uh, that compact passed, those are uh, the realities. Sure. But I think the Palauan people are fond of the, the United States and, and we have a very strong and healthy relationship. I know I think sometimes because of we're so far away from Washington, yeah. we're sometimes forgotten. Because of the Asian influence, uh, there's obviously more Asians here, but there is a strong relationship. We used to have the Peace Corps here, they had a strong influence in in, in Palau. Unfortunately, they say we're now a more developed country, so Peace Corps don't come, but I think that was something that uh, was very much appreciated. We also have uh, a lot of missionaries that come here from the United States mm. that also have an impact, I think, also in that building and strengthening that relationship. Right. So, and it's a pretty religious country, if I understand. Yeah, I, I think uh, more than 50% of the Palauan people are Christian. We have uh, three main religions here. We have uh, the Catholics, uh, Evangelicals, and our Protestants, and Seventh-day Adventists. Mm -hmm. There are people that would say the United States is pressuring us too much to do this or that. That's always normal, but just through our, our challenges that we've had, the economic challenges, the U.S. has been there. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think the people of Palau are grateful for that. That's great. And the reason we can have these meetings and have you here is, you know, that's really through the strong partnership that we have with the United States. Absolutely. What does the ocean mean to the Palauan people? Well, in Palau, we say the land is our mother and the ocean is our father. Our lives are very much tied to the ocean, especially men, because they're expected to fish. It provides us sustenance. It really is the engine that drives our economy. And it's so important for us now for fishing and for tourism. It's so important for us to make sure that we uh, protect it right. and sustain it. Sustainable use, sustainable um, uh, blue economy, mm -hmm. and, and that's really one of the reasons why Palau has the honor of uh, hosting the uh, Our Oceans Conference. It's, it's right. the opportunity for Palau to really showcase as a large ocean state the importance of the ocean to our, our lives. Right. It's challenging because, of course, marine pollution, the impacts of overfishing, illegal fishing, yep. those are things that we continue to combat, but 
a lot of times don't have control over. And, and so we've got to continue to do all we can to protect our oceans. But there's things that we can do. And so Palau has been uh, a leader in marine protected areas, you know, and that's why uh, part of our uh, philosophy has been we ask our guests to contribute to an environmental fund. It's mm -hmm. called the Palau Pristine Environmental Fund that is actually an airplane ticket. Yeah. And I know many people say that's really expensive, but that's, that's just part of saying we're sharing in this uh, ocean and we need to protect it and we need to have policies that sustain it. You're saying that's why it's so expensive to fly here? Oh, that's, why, uh, that's one of the reasons. No, really? that, that mass tourism complains about. Got it. But, you know, if people really value what we stand for. Sure. And so Palau has really made the conscious choice of saying, if it costs a little more, but the people are really coming because they're committed to yes. what we believe in and they're contributing to making sure that this is protected mm -hmm. and taken right. care of. That's you, the type of tourist that we want to You don't want disrespectful tourists. I no. mean, I, I understand. Yeah. I've traveled around Southeast Asia yeah. and I can see how some of that might come into play. It was a tough debate, you know, because the tourism operators are like, oh, we shouldn't be charging for this. But at the end of the day, we have to make a decision. And maybe it sacrificed mass tourism, but I think our goal was not mass tourism. Our goal was we want visitors to come, right. contribute in the protection and the sustainability of the beautiful ocean that God gave us. Right. And that's part of being good stewards. And we, we believe that we should be good stewards. Absolutely. Yeah. How do you balance sustainability goals with economical goals for Palau? Well, well that's, a, that's a constant battle because, you know, you have to pay bills. Yeah, you have to provide economic opportunities. There's the argument on one side that says we need mass tourism. Yeah. Let's just bring them in. As many people that can come in. Let's drop the price of the airfare. You know, when we have economic challenges, mm -hmm. they're saying, oh, let's get rid of that, uh, those extra fees. Let's make everything free so we right. can just bring mass tourism in. There's been a pushback. We say, well, sometimes we have to sacrifice. Right. Because our goal is not mass tourism. It's not money. It's about protecting our environment and having um, those opportunities for our people and for the world. So it's always a challenge. The people want to fish. The large persainers want to come in. And we said, no. We're going to close 80% of our EEZ to fishing. Got so it. right now we only have 20% open. But of, you know that, of the seas of Palau. Of the seas of Palau. 80% you cannot fish on. Yeah. And that concept is not a new concept. That's a concept that Palau has had for thousands of years, which is called a bull. And a bull is really sustainable management of our resources. So before the ocean you know, was divided up, we have 16 states in Palau by the 16 villages. And the chiefs of that village would decide, this is going to be, you can fish here or you mm -hmm. can't and for how long. And so the bull concept, which is what we have for our marine protected areas mm -hmm. is, you know, we'll close off an area, allow it to, right. to regenerate, then open and, and, and continue to use it sustainably, but make sure that we don't destroy it. Right. You know, Palauans were hunter gatherers, I think, in, in the past. And that, that was how they managed the resource to make sure that they could sustain sure. life and take care of their people. And so that's what we continue to do with our modern uh, patrol boats and, right. and trying to, and you know, we're grateful to our partners, uh, Australia, Japan, and the United States for you know helping us protect our EEZ and combat IUU. Because at the end of the day, the resource belongs to the Palauan people, right. and it shouldn't be over harvested, illegally fished, right. and we should you know uh, manage that resource so that it really benefits the people. Wonderful. But at the same time, protects it. Through YouTube and through content and people hearing about Palau, obviously they're going to want to come here, and a lot of people can afford the plane ticket. So I'm just wondering if you have a cap or a limit of how many tourists can come to Palau? Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm an economist by my degree, and I always believe in supply and demand. So really the way to, uh, to manage that is when as things become more expensive, maybe there'll be less visitors, but more importantly, visitors that really care about Palau. So it's really about investing in infrastructure and, and promoting high-end development that brings people in that really care about the environment and take care of it. So uh, there is no cap, but there was a study done that said, you know, we should think about 150,000 people. But, uh, you know, we don't have a very big population. Right. We only have 20,000 people. So probably when you approach 10 times the number of people in Palau as visitors, I think that's probably enough. There's only so many planes that can come in. Too. There's only so many planes that can come in. The other challenge that we have is, so how do we involve our people in the whole industry and how do they benefit from it? Sometimes because there's not enough economic benefit going into the economy, that's always the idea is get more and more and more and right. more. And we, we want to make sure that uh, uh, sometimes more can become less. We need to do more with less. And that's, uh, I think, the challenge that we have. And I think 
having a cap or really understanding that. And, the, and there's a way you do that. You just stop building more hotel rooms. Right. There, how many hotels do you have here? So right now we have about 2,000 rooms available on island. So if 3,000 people want to come, then they just can't because where there's do they There's not go? enough rooms, right? <laughs> Airbnbs maybe, but... Yeah. And so there was a time that the Airbnbs and when we had you know, a lot of tourists here, that was happening. But I think the people of Palau consciously said, no, that's, that's too much for us. Right. We need, to, we need to strike a balance and spread the tourism throughout Palau. A lot of tourism was just concentrated in Koror. But we have, like I said, we have 16 states. They need to go Peleliu, mm -hmm. visit Peleliu. You know, people that come and want to learn about World War II and right. also great diving and snorkeling. There's Angaur, who's the further, furthest uh, island to the south. And then there's, we have an island up north called Kaiango, yeah. and that's an atoll, which is yes. like the Marshall Islands. Like the Maldives. Yeah. And the Maldives, yes. So you can see what, if climate change and sea level rises mm -hmm. happens, it will continue to impact yeah. those islands and they may no longer exist. Yeah, it's the same in, in Kiribati. They said the highest point in Kiribati is uh, three meters tall. Yeah. And so the ocean goes up and they no have more. no, more, no yeah. more land. Have you witnessed any environmental changes over the last years and, and the future? What lies in that? I've been around for 50 years, half a century, and I've uh, had the opportunity to grow up in Palau. At certain high tides now in Palau, you will see docks that are covered, streets that are, have water in them that weren't that way 50 years ago. So in my lifetime, I've seen at least rise almost a foot. That's a direct impact. So we have challenges, a lot of challenges, because one of the issues that we have is we have a hospital that's near the, um, the ocean. It's just a matter of the next storm coming and blowing in the right direction, and it'll be wiped out. So those are real challenges and threats that Palau is now faced yeah. with because of the impacts of climate change. We had a typhoon come in last year, 20% of the homes were damaged because our homes weren't built to withstand those right. types of storms. Guam, you go and it's, you know, they have concrete roofs and concrete everything, but, and that's where the typhoon belt, it used to be north of us right. and go through Guam. Now it's moved south. Mm. So those are, you know, those are just real impacts and changes that are happening. And so we've got to build, you know. That's scary. You know, it, it's scary. It can happen. You can get a notification that next week a typhoon's coming and then. That's what do you, right. Like, what do you do? Yeah. You know? And so this village here in, in Milkyok, down by the ocean and the typhoon in Bofa, the sea was up six feet. You know, it's like having a tsunami coming through the village and, and this whole eastern coast was just mm. destroyed. Those are real threats. Where I come from in Arizona, we don't even you know, think about, even anywhere in the US really, we're not directly you know, mm. impacted by rising sea levels. We know about it, we hear about it, but in Palau, what you're telling me right now is very alarming. Yeah. So I, I hope that message is spread to pe more people. Yeah. It's real. We see it, we need to do our part. So really, I think uh, Palau, I mean, our marine conservation areas, preserving our forests, and then also trying to do as much as we can to um, have renewable energy to reduce right. our carbon footprint. Because we know, even though we're not the biggest emitter in the world, we're the smallest, it impacts us the most, and we also need to lead by example. Yeah. And uh, just like protecting our oceans, protecting our forests, we need to do all we can to also live sustainably and, and reduce our carbon footprint to help the world and to help Palau and our small islands throughout the Pacific that like Kiribati and yeah. Marshall Islands. I mean, Palau is fortunate in a sense that we have some higher ground, but why should we lose those beautiful islands that we have? We have one that's um, 360 miles from here where the delegate was, yeah. was yeah. from, and uh, it's called uh, Helen Island. It's only three feet above sea level at the highest, wow. less than a meter. We don't know how long that's gonna be there. I know in my lifetime, I went down there in 1980 with my dad, and it was a big island. It's now just a, mm. a sliver. And there's people yeah. living there. And there's people living, rangers now mostly just, it's hard to live there. But there was families living there before, and then now mm. it's, it's just rangers Terrible. because it's a, it's a beautiful reef system. We have to take care of it. It's a marine protected area. It's about 24 miles long. It's a big uh, reef. So. Right. Coronavirus has destroyed the world as we know it. Everything's changed. Lives are lost, jobs are lost, but this little beautiful sunny island of Palau seems to be unaffected by the pandemic itself. So, you know, just a, a big uh, shout out to our Ministry of Health here. Last year, they had to make the tough decision. I mean, we're a tourism dependent economy, but to shut down and say no more tourists. It was a tough decision to be made, but we did it. And then from there, really through our partnership with the United States, through CDC, mm -hmm. they, they continue to advise our health department on what our best practices. And knowing the limitations that we had with medical personnel, they said, you know, you need to inst implement uh, quarantine, you mm -hmm. need to shut down. And we did that and have been very fortunate. There hasn't been any 
COVID cases in Palau. Not a single case. Not a single case. And you've been testing people. We've been testing people. So we're, I think, up to like over 5,000 people that have been coming in since we've shut down and tested and still COVID free. But we've had strict measures. At, uh, at first, we were seven days quarantine mm -hmm. before you came to Palau, then 14 days quarantine in Palau, and then another seven days at home, so like 28 days. And, you know, and, it, and it, we kept on, no, actually it was started out 14 before you come to Palau mm -hmm. in Guam. So, it, you know, that has been shrunk down to your wow. arrival, that if you're vaccinated, you don't need to be quarantined. You know, we're just grateful. It's just another example of the partnership with the United States right. that uh, we had access to the vaccines. We had access two ways, either through the UN under the WHO COVAX system, which would be AstraZeneca mm -hmm. or with the United States. And with our special relationship with the United States, they said, no, you're part of the homeland. So we were part of Operation Warp Speed. And so when those vaccines started coming out in December in the US, Palau was on the list. So on wow. January, I think, 3rd or 4th, when they arrived in Palau, the US ambassador and myself went to the airport. We met the vaccines when they arrived. And we were in the first day of vaccination. We were both there to really help the people understand the importance of getting vaccinated, to protect our citizens, but to, you know, to keep us safe. That first shipment that arrived in January was just a ray of hope that, you know, we can get through this, we can conquer this, and we can move on. And this COVID is not gonna hold us back and keep us down. And, uh, you know, the people, it just the response has been amazing. You know, last five months, we've vaccinated, of the adult population that can vaccinate it, over 99%, which is uh, more than 70% of our population. This week, we're starting the vaccinations on the 12 to 18 year olds, because we had Moderna before, we have Pfizer now. Right. So they're gonna get vaccinated. That'll push us over 80%. 70% was herd immunity. Yeah. We're herd herd now. So you have to and be so, number one in the world with the most vaccinated people. Yeah, so we wanted to open with care. We want to do it responsively. And I think now if a COVID case does arrive, we know there won't be community spread. It'll be very limited and it'll be contained. And then we know that our people are safe. So the best thing you can do as a citizen is get vaccinated keep yourself safe, but really keep it from spreading in your country. And Great. we lined up and took it immediately because we believe that it's the best thing to do. Is there anything else you want to say about Palau to you know, millions of people watching this? First of all, thank you for coming to Palau and really allowing us to showcase Palau. And uh, we just look forward to as many people from around the world to come and enjoy uh, our people, our culture, and our, our beautiful island. I know it's hard to get here, but it'll definitely be worth your wait and worth uh, the opportunity to come here. So Drew, I, I'm sure you'll do a fantastic job in showing them all the treasures that we have here. We look forward to welcoming everyone to Palau. Thank you. I really appreciate your time. It's a very special opportunity for me and uh, I will remember this forever. Mr. President, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much. It's been much. a really cool opportunity for me to sit down with you and yeah. chat about Palau and the future of Palau. So I hope to be back here again soon. In Palau, we say Kamal Musulang, Mauri Ula. And Maurul means, uh, so Kamal Musulang is thank you very much. And Maurul means see you again. Absolutely. So that means you you need to come back. Hold me to it. I'll come yeah. back. Yes. Thank you so much for tuning in to this podcast episode. If you feel inspired by this conversation, please share it with somebody who would enjoy listening. And if you're here for the first time, make sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever else you get your podcasts. Also, don't forget to leave a review. Every week, I'm going to be looking through them and highlighting my favorite one. And with that all being said, I will see you guys next week.